Hello. So I was asked by the chair to introduce myself. So uh, my name is Sidi Chen, and I'm an assistant professor at Yale, and uh, my lab works towards mapping the functional cancer genome atlas. I add the name of functional before it because <laughs> we're trying to understand how it works rather than it's just there. Is that a point now? So as all of you in the cancer field know, the cancer is an extremely complex disease with thousands or even at least hundreds of mutations in each cancer patient that you can sequence. And this, the map has been sequenced many, many different times. So, okay. So now we have the cancer genome of more than 10,000 patients and accumulating, and we have more than 35 cancer types being sequenced. And these include mutations, copy number, transcriptome, proteome, epigenome, and even single cells these days in the cell mapping, uh, cell atlas uh, work. So what do we do next? How do we understand if a mutation is necessary or sufficient to drive tumor genesis as introduced by the previous speaker uh, beautifully? And, and once we know exactly what do these mutations do and do these progress in the native tumor environment, meaning it's just not transforming the cells, but also turn the healthy cell in the, the specific organ, for example, the lung and the brain and the liver, all these are very different organs. And do these genes interact? Like, uh, because we know all genes interact with each other one way or the other by the knowledge now, and if they do, do they interact epistatically or do they interact synergistically or additively? And how about we just map the entire thing at one shot to have a global view of the cancer genome in a functional manner so we can have a function, a druggable map or we can have a, a guidance for the clinical action of how we get it to work. So today I will tell you two themes. One is the, our effort trying to map it in the global scale and some of these are published, but the second part of the talk I will talk about two unpublished stories that are trying to gather your opinions as well. So, and the approach we're trying to use is the direct in vivo CRISPR screens, or we call it autophthalmic screen in the, the people in the uh, tumor modeling field. We know this is a, a tough job because you have to put all the viruses or the gene editing compounds directly in the healthy animal and trying to knock out the genes or perturb the genes, mutate the genes in vivo and trying to see what that mutation, hap what that mutation do in the healthy animal. And you can do this to the lung, to the brain, to the liver, to any organ you want. And then after that, you just watch for tumor genesis in these healthy animals, and they become diseased, they become sick, and then you take them down and you sequence them. And the first effort we're trying to, to do, just like the TCGA, is the glioblastoma because it's tough. And uh, the first map mapped out 71 cancer genes associated with you know, glioblastoma, and the subsequent ones have identified a couple hundred of them. And then we took all those like mutations in one shot, designed a pan can tumor suppressor gene library because we, we didn't uh, model oncogene at that point yet. And then all you need to do is package the pool of virus into AAV, adeno-associated virus, and then inject into the healthy animal and put it into the brain and see what happened. And uh, very clearly, these animals being undergoing poor mutagenesis develop a glioblastoma, and they all quickly die, uh, quickly means a few months. And with that, you can sequence the entire thing of the 52 animal brains, and then you can map out all the, I'm trying to point to it, but the point is doesn't seem to work. Oh, okay, there we go. So for example, this is one gene being knocked down, and this is one mouse have a dozen genes being mutated, which we can sequence, and you can map out all of them. So this is a one-shot mapping direct in vivo in the healthy organ of the immunocompetent mice. You can have a panel of drivers that are indeed making the cancer from happening in vivo. So this is the, the, the approach that we think is going to be powerful, but it's going to take a while, unlike the cell line approach. And then we can also do it for other cancer types, for example, hepatocellular carcinoma, instead of putting it into brain, you put it into liver, and you can see the, the liver cancer forming, mouse quickly die, and you sequence one shot, you have the whole map of the functional drivers of the liver cancer. And recently, we're trying to extend it to the entire genome by using whole genome CRISPR libraries. We do this first in the uh, 
baseline unsensitize the, the LSL Cas9 mice, and then we also extend it to make oncogene sensitized, P3 to be knockout sensitized, uh, and PI3K sensitized. But we do this by putting the uh, crossing the LSL Cas9 mice to the P3 to be knockout. You have to do three crosses and make it homozygous, and then cross. To, or you cross to the MIG oncogene, uh, or you cross to the PI3K mice. So you have the compound heterozygous mice, which expresses Cas9, which will induce tumor genesis upon the CRISPR knockout library. And then we can put it in the mouse and let the tumor grow. This is like a six, eight month experiment, but at the end of the days, we can map out all the rank mutations uh, under, uh, like in the genetic background of a big PI3K or a rack mice, which is fully immune deficient, and then we can have a rank list. We're still sorting this out, but uh, the, tumors, the genes that are functional drivers we map out from the liver cancer include KDM6 speed, uh, GTF2E2, and NF2, and, and a few others, and CSKN1A, and many others. And we did that for lung adenocarcinoma using a KRAS-driven uh, sensitized background. And then after we inject the whole genome knockout library into the lung, and then we can see the tumor forming. And then we sequence the whole thing. And then we can uh, map novel drivers in the, in the lung. For example, the RAP20A, U2AF, which is a spliceosome a factor, a role, and then smoothen, and many others. So with that, we believe this is a powerful uh, technology to map out the functional genome atlas that can turn the, the, the knowledge of the, the, the mutation sequence from patient directly into the driver, functional drivers into the animal models that are indeed giving you the answer of connecting the genotype to phenotype. And these are the coding genes. We're now trying to extend the effort to non-coding elements we utilize the TCGA small RNA sequencing effort, map out the snow RNA ohm in the 31 cancer types, and then after we check the distribution of the snow RNAs, and then we just map them to all the annotated snow RNAs, more than a thousand of them, and then we generate a large map of the snow RNAs for where they're being expressed and how they are being regulated and what cancer type they are in, for example, uh, we can group them by origin. Uh, for example, some of the snow RNA signature can classify the, uh, the cancer types like the gastrointestinal, kidney, lung, and, and melanocytes, et cetera. And then you can also classify based on the more specific, like uh, subgrouping the lung adenocarcinoma to lung squamous. And we can correlate these to the immune signature, for example, the, the uh, CDA T cell infiltration by using the cybersort method developed by the field and the uh, Granzyme, which is the uh, uh, effective cytokine and PDL1. And, and after that, we trying to find the genes that are important in order to make library to knock them out, uh, which is still ongoing. But we hope to further refine them by taking the signatures that are classifying patient survival, for example, the uh, if you overexpress the snow RNA, would the patients uh, live longer or would, would they do, or would they do worse? And we subclassify those in a few different cancer types like uh, uh, gliomas, liver, and the uh, endometrium, and the kidney, sarcoma, et cetera. And then after that, we have a, a map of the snow RNAs that does all, uh, associate the patient survival and the immune signature to various different phenotypes. And now we are trying to make a library to knock them all out using the same technology to, to see which non-coding RNAs can uh, drive oncogenesis or accelerate oncogenesis in vivo. And, but uh, as the field now, especially this field uh, knows, we think we portrayed these linear pathways, but in fact, they all look like this happening in the cells in vivo. So, but uh, fortunately, uh, as we can now try to understand the genetic interaction by doing double knockouts, and some of the early work has been done by the speakers earlier this morning uh, very beautifully. But now I'm trying to introduce you that the CPF1 enzyme is a neat little tool that you can make double knockouts very seamlessly with the simple one array of cRNAs, and then this cRNA array can knock out two genes or more genes if you wanted to, as we show in P NF1 P10, this is positive controls. And then we design a second generation, I skip the first generation for the sake of time, but then in the second generation CPF1 library, we took the genes that are mutated in patients' metastases rather than the primary tumors, 
in the uh, MET 500, like a Michigan OncoSeq uh, uh, patient data set, and then we took those genes, and then we designed a combinatorial library with the, the genes and the guideline and the anti non targeting guideline RNAs, and then these targets are uh, about 5,200 combinations, and we also spike in more than 1,000 NTC, NTC, double neutral controlled guide RNAs, and then we synthesize the chip as described uh, by the other speakers this morning. And then we also put the barcodes in, so we have uh, 11,000 guide RNA arrays, which target a combination of two, and these were barcoded by 774,000 uh, barcodes, which are the UMIs, and which were synthesized in the same library. And then we sequenced that. We saw the double knockout arrays and single knockout arrays, and the NTC NTC double neutral arrays in the in the same pool. As we see, they have a good distribution. So with that, we make lentivirus, and then we transduce cells which are not metastatic, and then we transplant these into mice, and we let metastases to happen. And of course, these are tumorigenic. They grow tumor for sure, but then we see which mutant drive metastases. And with that, we sequence the plasmid, the cell pool, and all the lung lobe form from various different mice. As you can see, the uh, cell pools have a pretty nice tight distribution of guide on a double knockout guide on a race, and as well as the double neutral. And the uh, lung lobes with cancer metastases are enriched in the ones that with single or double knockouts. And if you look at individual mice, you can see, for example, this mouse, when it, uh, it's sacrificed, it, it has a monoclonal spread dominated by uh, one clone of the guide on it, but some mice have more diverse clones in the library. So we dig into a little deeper analyzing the clonality, and we can see, of course, there's a, a, a sharp drop in the uh, number of clones because we have UMIs from the cell to the primary, and then there's further drop from the primary tumors to lung metastases. And we take a look at all that, and then we analyze which genes are being enriched, which gene pairs are being enriched in the metastases, and we identify a few of them being interesting. For example, the NF1, SHIM72, NF1CHD1, and RE1A, these are epigenetic regulators that are mutated in human cancer in the metastases, and they're also functional driver of metastases. And we did the uh, synergistic calculation to see if the addition of the two is smaller than the combination. And then we did the calculation, we run through the uh, combinations. And as the cliche of this field, we generate the in the interaction map as following using the uh, cytoscape and other like uh, visualization of the uh, how the two genes connect to each other and how strong the interactions are based on the the data and the uh, the links so with that we want to further uh, like zoom in to a few of the target for example the nf2 and trim 72 pair and these guide RNAs are like a sing, are the single knockout arrays, meaning they're in combination with the non-targeting control. It's either NF2 NTC or NTC and NF2. It can be arrays one, two, three, four of, of the combination. And these are the singles, and these are the doubles. And we can see how all the singles and the double behave across different animals. But uh, is this real? And uh, we just we, we got asked by, uh, certainly got asked by reviewers that uh, you want to show me the knockouts and you want to show me the, the double knockouts work. And then we have to, like, uh, of course, do the experiment. And then, uh, and as we can see, we rotated the uh, combinations of guide RNA position one and position two. And remember, this can be synthesized from one string, so you don't have to make two. You just only need to make one, but rotating the position of the double neutral ROSA control, NF2 ROSA, trim 72 ROSA, trim 72 NF2, and the flip, uh, but the same combination. And we saw that they cut as we expected, and they have a cutting efficiency of uh, about 25% for NF2 and then 15% ish for trim 72. Not as efficient as Cas9, but uh, you can do it with the uh, in vivo positive selection screens for sure.
And then with the double knockout at hand, we do a proliferation and we see this is not due to growth of the cells in vitro by BRDU, and, but they make the cells more aggressive as these are uh, like the uh, trans wall assays showing that these cells indeed migrate to the other wells more aggressively, and this is the double, not, double mutant compared to the single mutant. And when we put these uh, into the animals, and the, we can see that the cell line is not metastatic, so if you cut ROSA26 twice, it's not metastatic. And you cut NF2, generally quite a few metastases, cut TRIM72, generally some, and then you cut both, and there's a lot of metastases. So, and then we quantify these and we have the uh, validated in vivo that these are the metastatic co-drivers. So in quick summary, we think now it's very possible and feasible to do high through mapping of truly functional drivers in the native tumor microenvironment environment in the fully immunocompetent mice. Why this is good, why this is important? First, you can do it in one shot. Second, these animals have all the immune systems. That's why the immediate next step is to treat them with the checkpoint blocking inhibitors and uh, or like study the tumor microenvironment by single cell RNA sequencing, do the cell mapping and of the how the immune cell behave. We have uh, another story, like don't have time to talk about it, is actually mutating the drivers have a strong influence of the tumor microenvironment that you sequence uh, by single cell RNA seq. So, and then you can screen in the uh, drug, as I said, you can screen for uh, modulating drug target, coding and non-coding, and study drug intera gene, gene gene interaction in a systems manner. So in the future, as we all know the circle or the hallmarks, you can map function cancer genome atlas in any of the major hallmarks or put specific emphasis on any of the major hallmarks at a single cell level and in the therapeutic response and find the drivers for the cancer, uh, cancer immunity. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank my lab who did the work rather than me and uh, some collaborators internally and uh, previously in externally and the funding from uh, NIH and uh, other agencies. And thank you for the attention and thank uh, Chay for inviting. <laughs>